So, in our first episode, we talked about the beginning of the colonial period and just barely entered the age where the first English colonies had just begun to appear at Jamestown and later Plymouth. The main reason for us starting there and reviewing that time in history was to help us see how important an armed naval force was in the actual survival of these early efforts. Indeed, without regular and well-armed shipping from England, the colony at Roanoke had already failed. Likewise, the colony at Jamestown suffered significantly, and was even briefly abandoned in 1610 until the survivors met up with a supply fleet that was just then arriving and decided to turn back. Like, literally just arriving. The supply fleet was evidently sailing up the river, the James River, while the colonists had boarded the shipping that they had and were sailing down the James River. The need for this shipping to be able to protect itself was also by this point very well understood. Even the Mayflower, which was used in the settlement of Plymouth, was an armed ship. Indeed, she is reported to have carried some 20 pieces of ordnance, of which four were left to defend the settlement when she returned to England the first time. These armaments allowed ships to both defend against piracy and, in some cases, to allow them to capture and loot enemy ships themselves. As we saw in our first video, this was a very English thing to do in that period, and was one of the reasons for settlement in the first place. The increasing regularity of the shipping that came after the initial establishment of each of the colonies made the difference between extinction and survival for both Jamestown and Plymouth. Raiding of foreign shipping increased the wealth of at least the Jamestown colony, and it was through raiding that the first shipment of African slaves to Jamestown is believed to have arrived there. These slaves had been cargo on a Portuguese ship seized by English privateers and then brought to Jamestown in 1619. One interesting thing to note is that while they retained their status as slaves when they arrived in Jamestown, some of them were later treated as indentured servants and able to gain their freedom. At this point, it is probably wise to say a little about just how different these two colonies were from each other. As our friend Cooper states, nothing could be less alike than the motives which influenced the adventurers in these two enterprises. Despite the similarities of how they were actually founded, i.e. by using investors who sought profits from the new colonies, in character they were quite a bit different. Jamestown had aristocrats and class structure from the very beginning. While they were the first to have a representative assembly, having instituted one composed of all the adult males of English descent in 1619, they still had rather strict class distinctions. Further, the introduction of a hearty and sweet tobacco strain from the Indies by John Rolfe in 1612 had quickly led to plantations full of the stuff, stirring what would become the plantation system. Other industries, from pipe making to fur trapping, are known to have also existed. Jamestown, and the larger Virginia colony it was growing into, were all about making money. On the other hand, rather than to pursue purely economic goals, Plymouth was unofficially oriented around the Puritan religion. While these religious origins are often credited with bringing to the United States the more general concept of freedom of religion, it is important to remember that these early Puritan settlers were seeking the freedom to practice their own religion were generally less than tolerant of those that did not share their faith. As the colony grew and more settlements were established, dissident opinions arose and some members were even outcast on religious grounds. These outcasts founded other settlements that would later become the nucleuses for the states of Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. This seems to be among the primary reasons that New England became as fragmented as it is today, with many small states in a relatively small area. Likewise, the Mayflower Compact, which was signed by the 41 adult males of the Pilgrims in November 1620 aboard the Mayflower, is seen by many to be the first instance of equality and self-rule in the New World. The Mayflower Compact was admittedly a bit more diverse, as the initial assembly in Jamestown was only for men of English descent, which was only a portion of the men then in the colony. This fact led to the first strike in colonial America starting 30 June 1619, when Polish artisans in the colony refused to work unless they got the vote. They ended up getting the vote on 21 July, 1619. Even so, from the beginning, the Mayflower Compact was more geared towards an equal standing among community members and lacked the class distinctions that would characterize Virginia well into the 20th century. 
At the same time as these early English attempts, the Dutch were settling in what would later become New York and New Jersey, and the French were establishing a presence in what would later become Canada. Cooper even mentions that the first recorded conflict between these fledgling settlements happened in 1613, when an expedition from Virginia attacked the French in Nova Scotia, and then on the way home, demanded of the Dutch in New York possession of their territory, to which the Dutch agreed and then continued on as if nothing had ever happened. Later, the Swedes, employing men of many other nationalities, would even settle in what was to become Delaware, before being conquered by the Dutch in 1655. Moving back to English colonial attempts, things were a little rough until 1630. There were a number of other attempts at colonies during this time, ending in a colony being established in 1626 in what is now Salem, Massachusetts by the Massachusetts Bay Company. Yet things really began to take off in 1630. Additional settlers sailing in what became known as the Winthrop Fleet, and with the backing of the same company, established the settlement of Boston. Boston became the capital under the new governor, John Winthrop. Like the Pilgrims in Plymouth, these settlers were Puritans, a fact that was either lost on King Charles when he gave them the charter, or something he really didn't care about. After all, the company in his eyes was most likely about making money, not about religion. Meanwhile, in 1634, religious refugees of a different sort, this time English Catholics, began to arrive and settle in the new colony of Maryland, which was established by a royal charter given to Lord Baltimore. In fact, this charter was so broad as to essentially make Lord Baltimore the Duke of the new colony. He even appointed the royal governors, naming his brother, Leonard Calvert, as the first one. These new settlers established friendly relations with the natives and began to grow tobacco, making the colony very quickly profitable. Migration efforts were cut short, though, by 1640, because war was on the horizon. 1641 would see a series of civil wars begin in England. Some colonists even left to return to England in order to fight on one side or the other. Generally, Virginia remained loyal to crown interests and earned itself the nickname Old Dominion. The New England colonies, on the other hand, were more in favor of the parliamentary forces, as were most Puritans in general. These differences would lead to some significant problems in the future. During the wars, armed conflict even broke out in 1655 at the Battle of Severn in Annapolis, Maryland. After the crown was restored in 1660, Massachusetts was reluctant to accept the new king. This led to a series of administrative reforms and reorganizations for it and the other New England colonies that would characterize the next several decades. Looking back on this historical period, we can already see the seeds of revolution being sown. The Puritans had settled in the New World to establish the practice of their religion without the interference of the crown. They had supported anti-crown forces during the English Civil War, in part because these forces were more tolerant to other religions than the crown had been. Now, with the return of a monarchy, they found themselves at odds once again with that authority. Indeed, just over a hundred years later, this colony would see the initial battles of the Revolution. Many of the structures and even settings that were involved started in this period, to include the organization of training bands or militia, and even the layout of towns to include the village greens, where the first shots at Lexington were fired. Likewise, too, it is from these early Puritan settlements that the Navy itself would be born. Industries that these early settlers established, namely the fishing, whaling, and shipbuilding industries to support their seaborne trade, would be the stock and training grounds for the service more than anything else. Without the expectation or reality of any significant support from England during these early colonial years, most vessels being produced by the growing shipbuilding enterprises of the colonies were at least lightly armed. In addition to the threat of possible attack from Native American groups that were still very much in the area, Privateering and even outright piracy were common enough to warrant such actions. The threat of attack from other colonial powers was also omnipresent, although it lessened some in 1664 when the Dutch colonies of New Netherland, present-day New York, New Jersey, and Delaware, were actually captured by the English, thus effectively uniting the coastal territory of Virginia with that of New England. Yet even then, the French were well-established in Arcadia to the north, while the Spanish remained in Florida to the south. Yet also during this period, the Crown began to take an increased interest in colonial affairs and began to reorganize the territory and create new charters and colonies. New England was reorganized several times, and Charleston, in present-day South Carolina, was established in 1670, followed by Pennsylvania in 1682. This had the effect of spurring immigration to the English territories, so that by 1701, the population in the North American colonies of England was estimated at some 262,000 people.
These colonists were also increasingly engaged in several wars that were the offshoot of larger conflicts in Europe that England, and later Britain, were deeply involved in. The first of these wars that boiled over into North America was the Nine Years' War that began in 1688. It was known in North America as King William's War. More than any other factor, the series of wars that the colonies would be involved in over the next some 80 years would widen the divide between the nascent American identity and the crown. We'll discuss these developments and their increasing effects on colonial crown relations in episode 3 of this series. Until then. Now I know that we didn't get as far as I said we would in episode 1, but uh, I kind of wanted to keep these to a reasonable length, and when the core subject was approaching about 10 minutes, I figured that was the best time to break it off. So I'm kind of playing this by ear, still learning what I'm doing. Uh, I appreciate those who've actually watched the videos and made comments, and uh, I hope to do better as we progress. If you like what you're seeing, please subscribe and feel free to comment. Thank you.